Hello, uh, my name is Kevin Westerquake from Piapot First Nation and I currently live in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I'm going to be sharing some spoken word poetry with you. Um, I'm not going to introduce them too much, I'm just going to go ahead and share. The first one is called Humility. You see, I learned about humility right from the very start in life. I love teaching art to little kids because they have their whole futures ahead of them. They never judge you and they love you unconditionally and to me that's just so, so beautiful. I love teaching art to little kids so much that I found out that a couple of these kids hadn't eaten for a couple of days. So I took it upon myself to paint my face like a clown and march up and down the 20th Street core from the downtown Vimy Memorial fundraising, playing no particular beat on a snare drum, taking my feet to the street and fundraising some money just so some kids could eat. And at one point I wish someone would have done that for me. You see, I learned about humility right from the very start. I was diagnosed as a dyslexic learner. That means that everything that I had tried to read and write was backwards. I even remember trying to write my first Dear Santa Claus letter, and I think it went something like this. Dear Satan, all I want for Christmas is a real evil God. Because a real live dog probably would have made my childhood so much better. You see, people always seem to look at me funny. I guess that's why I kept my head down and I focused on my artwork. I missed out on a lot of social interactions during my elementary years like recess time, lunch time, or after school because you see I was a special education student. I had to read and write everything three times in a row before I could get it. I had to read and write everything three times in a row before I could get it. I had to read and write everything three times in a row before I could get it. You see some of these memories I wish I didn't have, like that time when I was about six years old and me and my friends, you know, we did a B&E, you know, while my friends were focused on the wealth and the gold on the shelves, I was focused on the food in the fridge, I was doing my best just to feed myself. You see, it wasn't that we were up to no good. And I went to a small high school near downtown Saskatoon to get the attention that I deserved. I played intramural basketball at lunch times to take me out of the lonely stairwells or the library with my nose buried in a book of poetry. I wore hand-me-down clothing until I knew I could finally work for myself. And then finally, when I thought I was becoming the master of my own destiny, I can dictate who stayed alive and who stayed next to me. In most of these holidays, I just wish I had a mom at home who was missing me. You see, I worked really hard all the way up into university. I worked two jobs. One job was in construction. And then finally, one was working as a research student research assistant in a molecular genetics laboratory until one day poetry found me. Now you see I find myself surrounded by many friends and I continue to make new friends all the time. And I've been celebrated for more times than I can keep track of. And I'm also the founder of a small group called the Indigenous Poets Society. And you know I'm going to continue on the way I'm going because this is my humility. Thank you, and um, the next poem uh, I'll share with you is in regards to a storytelling. And maybe I'll share a little bit of that story and a little bit of that history of the storytelling after this spoken word poem. I want to talk to you all about Mistasini, Mistasini, the big rock. You see, today it's poetry, but today I want to protest a little bit that I'm not lost. 
I'm not a child, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, mentally ill in any kind of a way. Although I sometimes feel like a prisoner in this great province of mine, and they're telling me that the last of the Indian fight is gone and the West has been won with some huge explosion way back in 1966, to be in fact. Mr. Sinney, I want you all to remember that. Misrepresentation, now that's another likely sounding word, but I hear they use that word inside and outside of political arenas. They're using that misrepresentation word to raise the cost of living, raise the food prices, raise the gas prices, and now they're telling us that we can't even protest or strike. You see, they're converting public health care systems into privatizations, they're omnibus pushing their robo calling and you see the sick are just not going to stop getting sick and the natives are not going to want to stop going to school so where's all the snaps on that petrol fool and you see they're coming up with all of these grand plans like let's build bigger jails or let's create all these new labor recruitment strategies but forget about all that for a moment because it's this one tiny clause that they threw into the Indian Act that had once deemed me a ward of the state because I'm Aboriginal. Ladies and gentlemen, this genocide will not be televised. And we have the red man, oh so unusual, right? From Nahewak to mascots, from oranges to apples, straight from Indian residential schools, preferential. And unfortunately, I remember once my grandfather and you know, most of them telling me never to speak Indian if I wanted the success or to survive. You see, unfortunately, you know, that's what I was told perhaps to appreciate that, you know, that little success that's uh, dangled out for us underneath these political puppets. You see, this, this, underneath. Underneath this Canadian constitutional many, this bloody, no, no, this star of the mouth style, mini me apartheid. You see, brothers and sisters, the political consciousness of the Canadian indigenous is awake and doing well, and we will remain idle no more. Now let's rewind time back a little bit, because you see I found a huge rock. Words had captured it, but eternally it bothers me that a sacred shrine of the Indian kind, petrified buffalo, aboriginal artifacts, a symbol of stone and a symbol of unity, and between you and me, destroyed so we cannot see what exactly freedom means to me. So perhaps out there in the spirit world, the ancestors, your ancestors, are not dividing up each other, the land you know, lining up the land and putting ourselves in little pieces of land, taking away each other's children by hand. We're not dynamiting each other's cultural landmarks and damming the Saskatchewan River over it and calling it a lake. Lake Diefenbaker, to be exact. You see, you're not going to find that in his storybooks because we carry our stories orally. Thank you. So that poem is really special to me because it signifies um, the, the storytelling, you know, and the belonging of Indigenous folks to this territory, you know. Um, in a lot of instances, you know, there's a lot of, you know, unwantedness in, in the urban environments which causes homelessness um, and you know everyone in all ages suffer from it and stuff and I just wanted to you know empower indigenous you know people that are listening out there and letting them know that they're loved by the land and you know we have a deep-rooted connection and our language is connected to this land to the stories you know, locations, um, and just to always remember that, you know. Uh, I remember finding this story, too, at the University of Saskatchewan, probably in 
you know, early 2000s, um, I would sit in the library reading all these stories and I, I came across that story and I looked even deeper into it and I found out that, you know, this place was actually a location south of where I am here. Um, and it was in existence uh, in, in a huge, beautiful valley, and it was a beautiful storytelling of um, a young boy who was lost on the prairie, and he was adopted by bison, as the story tells, and uh, he was raised amongst the bison. It was like it was it was beautifully, you know, read. It was beautifully written and told. And um, this little guy just kind of woke, uh, grew up, and as he got older, apparently he discovered that, you know, he, he was trying to discover who he was, and he discovered that he was, you know, human. And he went back to live with the human, the, the, the two-legged people. Um, and he left the bison. And then in the story, he, in his heart, you could see that, he wanted to bring those those people together, you know, the the buffalo and the bison in, in, in some way or some form. And he, he missed and he loved both uh, of his families, you know, and he, he started to get comfortable with living with, with people. And, you know, he he just, you know, they, they went on some sort of a hunt and he became excited. And it was said that he was trying to, you know, go and save the bison during this hunt. And uh, during this hunt, uh, it was it was really sad for him. And he his hair became unbraided again, and the mud went on his face. And they said, look, he's turning back into, uh, well, there's no word for wild. Um, he, he's turning back into, um, you know, that, 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 that that person, you know, that 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 his original being, you know, as a as a bison or a buffalo boy or whatever you wanted to call him, he he's turning back into that. They didn't really have a name for him, and uh, he they they said that he was ruining the hunt. But as this was happening, uh, this is where a little bit of the magic of the story comes in, uh, that. <clears throat> he transformed into a buffalo, like not only a buffalo, but a very huge buffalo. Uh, and then the, the hunters were running away and then that was what they saw and they were trying to keep watching it from, you know, the top of the valley and see what he was doing. And uh, I guess he just kind of watched them back and he sat down and he turned into this huge boulder that, you know, existed um, in present day late. Diefenbaker location and apparently the U of S Archeolo Archeolo Archaeological Society um, were very interested in this location and they were trying to petition the government to save it and it was home of one of the largest indigenous artifact finds in Saskatchewan's history uh, it had numerous teepee rings and, you know, it was just like the entire area was, was just covered with, you know, indigenous artifacts for living there for thousands of years. Um, <coughs> but unfortunately, uh, the government didn't see its value uh, and they, they'd much rather, you know, build this man-made lake that was in future years going to become a reservoir which is actually coming to light right now as we speak that they're trying to build this reservoir even more uh yeah anyways there it is there's a little bit of the the history of it i don't know too much i want to do another poem for you right now just give me one second um this poem is called Shapeshifter. I practiced my dark magic in secret, far-off places. I whispered to the winds my chants that echoed over these prairie fires. I yelped at dawn, inviting the stars with the coyotes, fear fearlessly howling, Oh! 
after my many chores, of course. You see, I had a childhood ripe with watering the chi chickens, cleaning the yard, feeding the horses, <clears throat> sharpening my mushroom's axes, mending his fences, clearing the brush, because Neomosome appreciated clear prairie views tirelessly. You see, I sometimes was called a dog upon the reservation, with no business hanging around the yards. You see, he had purebreds that had cool sounding names like Rocket, Pepper, or Lucky. Well, my name was always just Kevin. Pasture to yard, sniffing, digging, barking, barking, and shamelessly chasing horses and dodging kicks and always coming back with crooked shaped sticks that resembled the animals of the land or the rifles upon the walls. This is what reaffirmed my childhood shapeshifter days and it allowed me to be sneaky and clever. Afternoon bingos left me in an empty house and I snuck in of course steady like a mouse. And I creep through the old dusty photo albums in awe of the days gone by, guessing of Neomushim's adventures, sitting in his favorite chair, playing checkers with the clouds, and wishing the warmth of the sun was my grandfather's hugs, these first memories of a shapeshifter child, until I got brave with my shapeshifter ways turning into a black fly upon the kitchen wall, watching Cookum's cooking, wanting to steal a taste and buzzing on by with my mischievous bzzz flabas, majestic. Fresh cinnamon apple pies, wooden tables, and I'm so agile and I'm so able, hovering over the cooking pot, potatoes dancing around old time with carrots, teasing about so tasteful and always surprising me how she decidedly mixed it up perfectly with the cows and the chickens and the pigs and deliciously yet so gracefully switching it up with courses of natural flavors of the land like rabbit, duck, or deer. Oh, I was one lucky shapeshifter child and not one moment of boredom living in the old ways feeling genuine indigenous love, and even to this day, a proud wild child remains reminiscing of his childhood shapeshifter days. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'll share one more poem. Um, and then I'm going to end this session. And uh, this poem is a dedication poem and the poem is dedicated to um, this poem is dedicated to uh, the uh, some of our First Nations men and I'll just let the poem speak for itself and this poem is called Could You Remain Calm could you remain calm for some of our First Nations men who were tried for murder some 136 years ago for protecting broken treaty promises Emeyegamega where it went wrong one could you remain calm with people who came in to, and took over your home could you remain calm while they told you to speak another language and you need a written letter to leave a room with no access to the kitchen? Could you remain calm while your children grew weak with hunger, while they fed themselves all the food? Could you remain calm when they took away your children? Could you remain calm when they break all the rules you created as equals? Could you remain calm when you look out your window to a yard? <sighs> You once taught your children all that was good in this world. Could you remain calm when the land is destroyed? Could you remain calm when they fenced up and killed all the sacred animals that were once plenty like the stars? Could you remain calm when Mr. Hey Masqua, Big Bear, was not heard? 
Could you remain calm when alcohol is served to your young men who had never even seen a bottle in their lives? Could you remain calm when the phrase dysfunctional in a home seems to be birthed right before your very eyes? Could you remain calm and respect leaders who swore to protect your families, sitting defeated, helpless, and powerless, and full of shame? Could you remain calm when that shame seems to be passed on to your sons, their sons, and our sons of today. Could you remain calm as they change your beautiful poetic names? Could you remain calm when you fear for your sisters, mothers, and daughters? Could you remain calm when you stayed loyal to the promises and they still seem to slap you in the face? Could you remain calm when you have to bury your families from sicknesses and starvation and all the while they seem to preach the word of a God who had seemed to have abandoned them? Could you remain calm, M.A.A. Gamiga, where it went wrong? One of the main selling points of the treaty to share non-surrendered Indigenous land was a guarantee of assistance from famine and pestilence, a medicine chest, which was never opened, a medicine chest that was never even seen. And you see, these young men did not stay calm. Like the man in Wandering Spirit, who sang a love song to his wife as she put their son on her shoulders. Well... These young men were hung and buried in a mass grave out near North Battleford. These men deserve a day like today, so I'm going to recite these names with great pride and sorrow. Wandering Spirit, Round the Sky, Bad Arrow, Miserable Man, Itka, Man Without Blood, Iron Body, Little Bear, Public Hanging, Fort Battleford, November 27th, 1885. Thank you all for listening, and uh, I appreciate your time, and your... Yeah, I appreciate your time, and I hope you have a good future ahead of you. Thank you.